Number three, the filthy 13. A good chunk of people have probably heard of the 1967 movie The Dirty Dozen, but not many of them know that the film was based on a real United States demolition squad called The Filthy 13. The Filthy 13 consisted of 13 men who were assigned to the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division during World War II. The group got their token name when they were stationed over in England for training. The men were literally filthy. Many of them refused to wash or change their uniforms and only bathed about once a week. But this was also heavily mirrored in their attitudes. Far from being model soldiers, they didn't see the point in some military practices, like saluting and the discipline expected of other squads. After all, when they were risking their lives out on the battlefield, none of that mattered. This attitude led the group to have many disagreements with their superiors, one of them being their commander, Colonel Sink, who many might know from Band of Brothers. One of their most notable people in the Filthy 13 was Private Jack McNeese. He took over leadership of the squad by becoming their sergeant on June 6, 1944, after their previous leader, Lieutenant Charles Mellon, was taken down in combat. McNeese was part Choctaw, and this bled over into his command of the Filthy 13. They would often paint their faces in war paint, taking pigment to do so from the pots being used to paint planes for the D-Day landings. McNeese himself also had a mohawk, claiming that the hairstyle helped prevent head lice. The first real test of combat the Filthy 13 saw was on the D-Day landings, otherwise known as Operation Overlord. In the early hours of the attack, McNeese and the rest of his squad were ordered to parachute down into enemy territory, take out two bridges, and then secure another in Carrington to stop the German forces from calling in any reinforcements. On the way to their objective, their plane came under fire, leading it to land eight miles out from its initial target. As a result, McNeese, who was in control of the operation, was unable to find any of his team members once he safely landed. This didn't seem to phase him. Instead, he started making his way to the objective site on his own, picking up soldiers along the way to help him, effectively making a brand new squad. With this team, they managed to carry out the mission, securing the bridges and hampering the German response to the D-Day landings. The next major mission the Filthy 13 were involved in was Operation Market Garden, taking place between September 17th to the 25th, 1944. Countless paratroopers were sent into the Nazi-occupied Netherlands to secure an invasion route for Allied forces to break through and increase movement from the Belgian border to Nijmegen, Holland by Eindhoven. The Filthy 13, as part of the 101st Division, was part of the market side of things. The airborne assault and the garden stage of the operation was carried out mainly by British ground troops who advanced and linked up with the paratroopers. Many see Operation Market Garden as a bridge too far and one of the biggest setbacks for the Allies during this stage of the war. But the operation was partially successful, and it was all thanks to the efforts of the Filthy 13. The aim of the airborne troops was to capture bridges from the Belgian border to the city of Arnhem and to capture the city of Eindhoven. The 506th, 501st and 502nd regiments were expected to do this within six days. But they surpassed all expectations, completing all of their objectives within just 36 hours. The Filthy 13, despite their dislike of authority, were also proving their worth. As a result, they were tasked by the regimental commander to guard three crucial bridges on the Eindhoven Canal, proving the trust people had in them to do their job, and they did just that. Three months later, in December of 1944, Jack McNeese was asked to volunteer for the Parachute Pathfinding Service. The fact that this was a volunteer position said a lot about what you should know about the role. Pathfinder teams were built of 10 men, and eight of them were expected to die on the mission. The remaining two were expected to finish the assigned job. Since it was so dangerous, men were never forced to take the job, since for 80% of them, it was a death sentence. Despite this, McNeese agreed, and amazingly, when the rest of the filthy 13 saw him packing up his bags, 
they also followed suit and decided to volunteer. In Shagrove, England, all the dedicated volunteers who served as Pathfinders were assigned to the 9th Troop Carrier Command Pathfinders. Upon their arrival, McNeese reported to Captain Frank Brown, who was in charge. Recognizing McNeese's valuable experience in combat since the Normandy invasion and his two prior jumps, Captain Brown decided to appoint him as the first sergeant. This decision was made with confidence in McNeese's ability to lead and train the Pathfinders for upcoming missions. Together, they aimed to make sure the team was prepared to tackle any future assignments that lay ahead of them. On December 23, 1944, McNeese was told to get his 10 men ready for the deployment. The 101st Division was cut off in Bastogne and was in dire need of ammunition, food, and medicine supplies. They were set to jump that same afternoon. McNeese suggested to his captain that they should send two Pathfinder units out to Bastogne. This was because he believed that even if one aircraft was shot down, the other could carry out the goal successfully. McNeese's request was granted, and he ended up in the lead plane for the operation. He used orange smoke to tell the second aircraft when to deploy once they landed and made sure it was safe. This ensured that all 20 men landed in the same spot to carry out their mission. McNeese was commanding 20 men, of which, based on the current death ratio for Pathfinders, 16 of them were actually supposed to die. Not only did they carry out their mission successfully, but only one man passed away. Jack McNeese defied all of the odds when it came to pathfinding missions. Thanks to his and his men's efforts, over the next five days, Allied forces were able to drop 600 plane loads of food, gas, medical supplies, and ammunition into the Bastogne area. Although their methods were unusual, the Filthy 13 played an instrumental role in World War II, showing that even the stinkiest soldiers could be true heroes. Which of the remarkable feats carried out by the Filthy 13 impressed you the most? Let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button while you're at it. Number 2. Desmond Doss Desmond Doss grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia. He was a devout Seventh-day Adventist and held strong pacifist beliefs. This meant he was against most violence and chose not to carry weapons on him. When World War II came around, Despite having the opportunity to be exempt from the draft thanks to his job in the defense industry, he declined the chance to defer. Doss wanted to contribute to his country like other young men, so he decided to join the Army Medical Corps as a non-combatant. But his conscientious objector status created many challenges for him during boot camp, which was an extremely tough experience. His refusal to perform duties on the Saturday Sabbath, as well as his overall beliefs, made him an easy target for threats and harassment. Some of the other recruits sometimes threw shoes at him while he was praying, and they even tried to have him transferred out of their unit. But all of their attempts failed, and Doss made it into the 307th Infantry, 77th Infantry Division. The biggest test for Desmond Doss came during April 1944, when the 26-year-old and his battalion were sent to help in a battle near Uraso Mura, Okinawa which was one of the biggest campaigns in the latter stages of the entire Pacific Theater. The job given to Doss's battalion was to scale a 400-foot-high jagged cliff face named Hacksaw Ridge using cargo nets in order to get high onto a plateau. But dotted along the cliff face hiding in small caves and waiting at the top strategically were thousands of heavily armed Japanese soldiers lying in wait to ambush the American forces. A week into the campaign, Doss was the only medic available that could advance with a group of soldiers that were coming near the plateau. But this took place on a Saturday, which was the Sabbath for Doss, when he made a point never to work thanks to his religious beliefs. But this time, he still agreed to go. As the battalion tried to climb the practically vertical cliff face, heavy fire rained down on them from above with machine guns, artillery, and more. The men had to retreat back after suffering many losses. Every soldier who was able to retreat did so quickly, leaving just one man up on the plateau among the wounded and dying, Desmond Doss. One by one, he treated the injured, often right in front of enemy troops. He would then lower them down to safety on slings that propelled them back down the cliffside. 
As every man was sent down by Doss, he prayed in his heart, saying, Dear God, just let me get one more man. Get just one more man. And Doss certainly did. By the end of the night, he had personally saved 75 people. Some of the 75 had even been those that relentlessly tormented and bullied him back in boot camp, but Doss still saved them all the same. Days later, the American army made another advance up Hacksaw Ridge. Doss braved a shower of grenades with his fellow soldiers from the mouth of a cave. Many of the men were injured, including Doss himself, who suffered severe injuries to his leg. Despite this, he treated the wounds of his comrades making four trips to pull them to safety, before tending to himself. Doss waited five hours before he was finally rescued. The men carrying Doss back from this attack ended up having to take cover from enemy tanks. While they waited for the barrage of fire to cease, Doss climbed off the stretcher and treated another ill man who was sheltering with them, before demanding that the other man get on the stretcher instead of him. Doss then continued the rest of the journey on foot with a badly injured leg. This made him an easy target, and a sniper managed to shoot Doss in the arm. The impact of the bullet shattered his bones. With one arm remaining, he managed to make a splint using a rifle stock and was able to crawl his way to a medical station for treatment. In October 1945, Desmond Doss was brought back home to the state where he underwent a surgery to remove the bullet pieces from his arm. As soon as this was finished, he went to Washington, D.C., where he received the Medal of Honor from President Truman. Despite refusing to ever pick up and use a gun and still observing the Sabbath, he also received the Purple Heart and Bronze Star, all without harming another human being. And at number one, Frank Luke Jr. Frank Luke Jr. from Phoenix, Arizona, was an American pilot whose incredible achievements in air combat during World War I earned him a reputation as a leading balloon buster. Although he had natural flying abilities, Luke occasionally faced challenges adapting to the strict military hierarchy and discipline that characterized command structure. Despite this, his aerial prowess set him apart from the other soldiers. Luke started flying in August of 1918 as part of the 27th Aero Squadron of the 1st Pursuit Wing and conducted patrol missions. It was a month later in September that Luke came face to face with German observation balloons. While these blimp-like structures initially seemed harmless, they were incredibly dangerous. It wasn't the observation balloons themselves that proved to be a problem but the balloons were heavily guarded with multiple anti-aircraft guns and often military aircraft as well. This could spell disaster for any pilot wanting to take one down. But it was imperative to remove as many balloons as possible, since they were an incredibly useful asset. Not only could they provide information on enemy movements, but they allowed observers to give feedback to troops on the ground, allowing them to adjust artillery strikes in real time and improving their accuracy and power. Having an observation balloon in the air could easily turn the tide of the battle. It turned out that Luke was pretty good at taking these balloons down, and the US didn't want to lose a good pilot. So he was grounded and told that if he went out flying somewhere, he would be declared AWOL. Luke didn't care and flew anyway. Between September 12th and September 29th, 1918, he shot down a total of 14 observation balloons. September 29th marked the day that the young pilot shot down three balloons in under 45 minutes, something no one had managed to do before. But this stroke of brilliance eventually led to Frank Luke's downfall. Not long after he shot down the third balloon, Luke came under anti-aircraft fire and was taken down. At the time of his death, he'd racked up 19 confirmed aerial victories, including both balloons and enemy aircraft. This made him one of the top U.S. aces during World War I. Luke's remarkable deeds earned him the prestigious Distinguished Flying Cross two times. Not only that, his extraordinary contributions were recognized even after his death when he was bestowed with the Medal of Honor. 
This notable recognition made Luke the first pilot from the US to receive such an honor during World War I. Not bad for a man who should have been court martialed. Thanks for watching. Which one of these rogue soldiers shocked you the most? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more amazing videos. See you next time.